everybody. This is Brother Luke. Praise Jesus. It worked. Last Sunday was the first time in a year and a half, probably, let me see, that would probably be about 70 continuous Sundays. And almost every Wednesday, we, we've done Sundays and Wednesdays regularly for about a year and a half now. Last Sunday was the first time that the internet failed us and, and, and uh, the technical problems uh, prevented us from having our program. And so I was kind of sweating it and praying that tonight everything's going to work as usual, and it does. So thank you, Jesus. Okay. Uh, well, I should have said it. Hi, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. And um, before we get into the subject matter, the the study of Romans chapter 15, verse 22 is where we'll begin tonight. Um, let's let me have uh, Brother Cripps say hi to everybody. I mean, Brother, obviously, we get new people all the time, so um, oh, sure, sure. I but I, I met you yet. introduce yourself, please. <laughs> I, I was gonna say that I that uh, everybody knows who you are, but I we do get we do get new viewers all the time. So, my name is Jason Cripps, and I'm part of a channel called True Story Live. Uh, we come on Sundays at 9 uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm also on this channel uh, once a week on Wednesday nights for the awesome Sin City uh, Preacher slash Church of the Trinity Secure Bible Study. And then also on uh, Talking Doctrines on uh, Monday's Milk on Mondays. So uh, I'm proud to be here as usual. And uh, hello to the chat. Love seeing you guys. So I'm, uh, I'll, I'll be um, interested in getting into the into the word. Yes, yes. Okay. I, uh, um, the, the people who are regular uh, participants uh, in the congregation, particularly in the chat room, we are, are very much aware that normally it's Brother Cripps, Sister Renee, and myself, and sometimes Brother uh, Michael from Ultimate Mordecai. Uh, I'm not expecting Sister Renee tonight. Uh, she didn't contact me and tell me this, but I, I gathered from her recent video that she just left town and she's on a vacation or something. So I'm not expecting her. Uh, maybe she'll surprise us and show up. But um, uh, I also did send the link to uh, Brother Michael, Ultimate Mordecai, as usual. But you who follow his channel know that he's been very sick for a week. So... Uh, Maybe he'll maybe he'll feel up to it and join us. He has the link. Uh, but uh, we have uh, Brother Cripps and myself, and we're going to go through the study. But first, let me say hi to everybody in the chat room. Uh, thank you uh, for participating in the chat room. Especially thank you to the moderators. Uh, I, I just can't thank you. Enough. We could not function without the moderators uh, dealing with the trolls. And also, uh, you're kind of the welcoming committee for, for our church here. If you see someone new in the chat room, uh, make sure you t take time to welcome them. And, and if you are someone new here for the first time, uh, I, I hope that you enjoy this Bible study and it's a blessing to you. Maybe you'll want to join us every Wednesday and uh, it's 6 30 p.m. Pacific time on 9 30 Eastern time is when we do the Wednesday program. And also, the Sunday program begins at 2 p.m. Pacific. That's 5 p.m. Eastern. And that's our Sunday church service. Uh, uh, some of you probably are aware that I made a little video a few days ago announcing that the last Friday's program was such a, a wonderful time. Uh, so many people enjoyed it and expressed the desire to continue them. So uh, I've decided to uh, allocate Friday nights for that now it's called fellowship fridays It'll awesome 6 30 p.m pacific that's 9 30 eastern time and it's going to be basically not a study uh, not a church service but just a a fellowship and and praise report time and uh, last time it was all about uh, reporting uh, the miracles in our lives and uh, we had a lot of miracles to celebrate so we'll continue that uh, and uh I may not do it every Friday because I have some other uh, uh, programs uh, in, in mind. I'm going to do with Brother Jason uh, Jack and, and uh, a few other things. So sometimes I might not have that 
f fellowship Friday, but more times than not, I expect that we'll do it Fridays. Uh, okay, Brother Krebs, anything you want to say, announcement, or anything you want to say before we uh, get started in the text? Well, I want to say that the uh, the Friday broadcast was fantastic, in my opinion. I did get a chance to listen to the whole thing, and uh, just really edifying um, all the way through, and got a chance to hear uh, a lot of different uh, people share their uh, share their miracles and whatnot, and um, I, it's the it's the busiest I've ever seen one of your panels, brother Luke. <laughs> the most people. Did you say that you had people uh, on the waiting list to get in? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I, um, those of you who have been following me doing these programs for years now, uh, I've done probably six hundred of these live programs now, and and I always limit the panel to a uh, maybe. Uh, two, three, or four, five people at the most, and they're selected. They're people that I decided that I, I want to have on the panel for a particular reason, because I believe they're qualified to, for the, the purpose we're trying to achieve. Uh, so I don't open the panel up normally for anybody to join. Um, but last Friday and uh, in the future Fridays, uh, I'm going to just put the link, link out there publicly and ask uh, anybody that wants to join the panel, either you're welcome, as long as you agree with the my statement of faith, which explains the core doctrines of our church. And um, if you don't agree with our statement of faith, you can still uh, participate in the, uh, by listening and in the chat room, as long as you're not trying to uh, challenge our core doctrines in the chat room. Uh, but if you uh, do agree with the statement of faith and you want to get on the panel, uh, you're, you're welcome to do that. And uh, we the, the limit, though, on these programs, just the technology will only allow 10. 10 is the limit. So we had more than 10 people that wanted to get on. And so some had to wait uh, for an opening to, to join the panel. But I, I mean, it was a lot of fun doing it like that. I look forward to more of them. But really, for something that's I, it was actually very cohesive. It was not chaotic or disorderly, even though there were 10. I mean, that's the, that's amazing to me. Yeah. Really keeping them smaller. You have a, a much more or, organized, orderly uh, conversation. Sure, sure. It was it was uh, edifying and uplifting. So I'm glad you're going to do like a a fellowship thing every Friday. I think that's a great idea. Okay. All right. So before we uh, get into the text, uh, let me just remind everybody that these Wednesday night Bible studies um, we've done a lot of them already. Um, the first uh, studies were um, dedicated to analyzing famous sermons we we analyzed uh, um, um, warrant of faith i noticed you guys talked about that uh, on your program saturday or sunday night uh, or somebody's program and uh, uh renee and i d discussed that uh, i remember if you were with us then brother Cripps or not but i was we listening actually when, when you guys did the sermons, I would, that's when I was listening to the show, wasn't on it. Um, you did have me come in and uh, as a guest, uh, the tail end of the last sermon that you guys did, I think is the first time I was on. Yeah. Well, if you go back to the playlist, Wednesday Night Bible Studies, you'll find all of those. Uh, we did a series on Charles Haddon Spurgeon's great sermon, Warrant of Faith, and it, we gave it 100% perfect A+. Plus. Best sermon in history, <laughs> and then uh, we next we went to um, uh, "Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God" by Jonathan Edmonds. Yeah. And we hated every word in it. <laughs> uh, then we went to uh, um, the sir the sermon that caused a lot of problem like ten years ago. Uh, Paul Washer did. Uh, that disturbed the youth. The youth uh, forgot what it was called, but uh, he was basically making everybody doubt that they're even saved because yeah. they, didn't, they didn't have enough dedication to serving. Yeah. So uh, we hated every part of that and refuted it and proved it wrong. But uh, since then, we started working our way through the Pauline epistles, and, and of course, Romans is the first epistle. Um, I hope you'll go watch the Roman study from the beginning, especially the introduction and the first couple of chapters were really very um, important because I th think the concept of prosopopoeia, I'm not going to explain it now, 
maybe just pronouncing the word will make you curious enough to go back and watch that. <laughs> but the concept of prosopopoeia that I think Paul used uh, uh, is profound and gives you a different understanding of the first beginning of Romans. Uh, and then, of course, we get to Romans 9, and that was, to me, one of the most important studies I've ever done in yeah. all my years on YouTube, because Roman 9 is, is what Calvinists used to prop up that damnable evil heresy. Yeah. Uh, Calvinism. So, uh, and now we've continued, and now we're in chapter 15. We're in 16 chapters, so we're approaching the end of Romans now. And uh, we'll move on to working our way through the Pauline epistles. Awesome. Okay, so let's begin with uh, verse 22. Uh, KJV says, For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you, but now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come unto you whensoever i take my journey into spain i will come to you for i trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you if first i be somewhat filled with your company but now i go unto jerusalem to minister unto the saints so that's 22 through 25. But I'm afraid, uh, brother, we probably need a little bit more context. Let me go back and read a couple of verses earlier. Sure. To give you some context. Because when he says, for which cause, in verse 22, he, he's, uh, he, you need to understand what he's referring to. So, um, so I'm going to start with uh, uh, verse uh, 17. I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Elycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I preached to the, the two, so I have strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation, but as it is written, uh, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. So those are the preceding verses. All right, brother. I'm sorry. I might have been confused, everybody, by the way. I presented that. What are your, your thoughts? Uh, no, I just thought you were uh, getting people up to speed. If uh, Renee was here, she she would have reminded everyone uh, what we've been talking about as to uh, the eating of uh, one thing or another, and we shouldn't be judgmental of other people um, that... Uh, you know, if something is a sin to someone, then it's a sin to them. But if not, it's not. And uh, we should keep those to ourselves and not eat meats and stuff. And that that's the that's how this all started. Right. I mean, that's the, the background. Yeah, of it. That, that's even a, that's even a, a, a better uh, indication of the context of the chat. The last chapter. Too. Right. Um, OK, so he says, uh, let me read it in the Amplify, that new portion. It says. Uh, this goal, which is uh, this, which is my goal, my commitment to this principle, is the reason why I have often been prevented from coming to you in Rome. But now, with no further place uh, for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, whenever I go uh, on my trip to Spain, I hope to see you as I pass through Rome and to help uh, on my journey there by, by you after I have first enjoyed your company for a little while. Okay, brother. Um, there's not a whole lot of theological stuff there uh, for me to grab onto. And you just basically, um, and you basically tell him that, uh, I, and, and from last week, he was saying that, you know, he's already preached everywhere that needs to be preached. So now he's going to go to the saints. And that's the bottom line. Um, he's uh, sharing with them his desire to be with them and uh, be filled by their company, et cetera. Um, and now it's just telling him in verse 25 that he's 
going to Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. And I will say this, a lot of people, when they talk about scripture, they think that um, everything is for uh, the unsaved, as if uh, as if uh, the saints don't need uh, to keep hearing some of these things and keep being revitalized by these things. And that verse will go a long way to, to kind of tell us that we all need to continue to hear uh, biblical words. We uh, need to continue to be edified and lifted up by scripture and by each other. Um, I, I will add that at the end because I've had conversations even over the past couple of days uh, in that in that way where uh, someone is is looking at scripture and saying well, this is for the unsaved and a lot of times it's not a lot of times it's um, I, I think the assumption is made and maybe I'm going in a completely different direction here and I don't want to do that but it just seems like some people think that that scripture is isn't also for those people that are saved and uh, they don't need it as much. Well, I, how's my fan? Is it, uh, is it causing the audio any problems, or is it okay? No, sir. Sounds good to me. All right. Okay. I, I guess I'll turn it off anyway for a minute because it is distracting me a little bit. Um, I guess three things come to mind here um, based upon what he's saying now and, and uh, just just before this uh, these verses. Uh, he was talking earlier about doctrinal issues, and uh, and then he then he talks about how he is mainly wants to share the gospel, um, but uh, he also says he desires to have fellowship with these people. Uh, he says, uh, how did he phrase it? Um, uh, but in, in verse 25, but now I go into Jerusalem to, to minister mm. unto the saints. Yeah. Now, actually, if earlier he says he desires for many years to come to you in Rome. He's talking to the Roman church, how he's desired for many years to come to them uh, for fellowship. So uh, he, here you have, just in the last couple of chapters, what Paul is working on is, one, teaching them the doctrine about how to deal with brothers who are weaker in the faith. And he also talks about how his really main goal is to keep on sharing the gospel wherever. And now he's he's covered this whole territory. Uh, but he also has a desire to come to Rome to meet them in person. He hasn't been to Rome as, as far as I know. I think I think the only, it's just been correspondence uh, with, with Rome. And... Uh, uh, I, don't, I may be wrong, but I, I, I don't think he, he did not establish the church in Rome, I don't think. But right. um, I, I think that um, uh, so he wants to have this fellowship time with them. And then he also says in Jerusalem, he has some ministry. He has to minister them. Minister means he has some service he needs to provide this church in Jerusalem. And what is that? Uh, in the earlier chapter, he was talking about he was raising money to take to Jerusalem because they, they had some need in the Jerusalem church. So you can see that what Paul did was a, a lot of things. It's like a lot of us, first of all, I've said this so many times over the years, that when a person is born again, they are, are, are not only uh, at that moment, instantly, now a child of God and have eternal life guaranteed to them but now they punch their clock and the, and the, and the, they're on the payroll and uh, their work is supposed to begin you're you're now you you've got a job to do every mm -hmm. christian is a minister that I means a servant um, we must believe on jesus to get salvation there's nothing else we must do but well, there are other things we should do, and Paul is doing all these things. He's teaching and correcting their doctrine. He's he's doing he's teaching he's sharing the gospel. He's he's meeting with people to have fellowship and, and uh, have time and, and desiring to congregate with with the, the believers. Mm -hmm. And he's serving by raising money to take to the church in need. So you see, Paul did not say, "Well, I." hate wait it's only my job to be an evangelist right and i'm not i'm not in charge of raising money that's someone else's job well no right. 
that I'm too busy to have fellowship. I just got to keep on preaching the gospel everywhere. Uh, Paul recognized that even though, as he says, this body of Christ has many parts and we all have our different roles to play. Now, I, I, my role, I recognize it. I learned from the beginning I had a particular role because God has given me certain talents and I just wanted to use my talents for serving God. And, and I think my talent is teaching and evangelism, telling people the good news and then teaching doctrine. And that's what I do. But if I, if I have an opportunity or if there's a need for me to do something else that's not really even in my comfort zone, that's not my particular calling, I'm not going to say, well, no, no, go see Brother Cripps. He's better at that. That's his gift. Huh. No. So if, if you're listening now and you uh, you came to faith and you're a child of God, uh, realize that uh, you should first pray and ask the Lord, reveal to me my role in this body, my part in it, and, and my gift, and, and uh, so that I know what I'm called to do. And then when you understand what you're called to do, you get busy doing it. But you don't wipe your hands and say, well, that's not my job. Anytime there's a need, you fill in however you can. And that's what I'm seeing here. Paul is, is wearing many hats. Yeah. Yeah, haven't you uh, talked before? You made a, uh, a point about how he works with his own hands, uh, tent making, I believe it was. And he did that for himself. He raised money. Um, and, and I know people gave him gifts, especially when he's traveling. Uh, you know, uh, uh, people helped him along when he needed it, but he, he generally worked with his own hands and provided a living. Um, and there were, there were times even that he, uh, took a season to do that. If, if I, uh, remember correctly. Um, so that's a good example for us as well. Um, ministry is extremely important and we can work and do, uh, do other things and invest in our relationships and, uh, fellowship and all that stuff. And I agree with what you're saying, you know, when you, uh, yeah, you clock in. Is that what you said, Brother Luke? You clock in like uh, you become a believer and you're on the clock and there are certain expectations of you. And I completely agree with that. And and I'm guilty of having uh, taken quite a bit of time off. I, I will talk to anyone that, that God put in my path uh, to to talk with and give an answer for what I believe, et cetera. But um, uh, that's not an issue anymore. And I, I tell you, I've been edified by being a part of all the broadcasts uh, that, that I'm doing. And, it, and it's it, it's not that I'm so great or anything, but I, I, I sleep better at night knowing that I'm on the, the battlefield. I'm, I am clocking in and actually doing something. And God can use me in that way, I hope. Uh, and, and it's way better than the other way. So, mm -hmm. yeah, well, it, 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 there's also a, a thing that we have to keep in mind, and, and that's that's perspective. Um, there are many examples of some of the most famous Christian uh, evangelists, uh, tent revivals, or you know, some of these people that um, I'm not going to mention names, but that. It's, it's not uncommon for them to, to dedicate everything to their ministry. Right. They, they failed their wife. Yep. They failed their children and their grandchildren because they there was no time left for them. Yep, that's right. Now, I, I'm reminded when Paul talks about, um, he, he says, um, if, if you were going to um, burn with lust, Rather than ha suffering from that, this and maybe succumbing and fornicating, mm -hmm. uh, you you should just get married. If 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 you're the kind of person that has that kind of a uh, great need, uh, and uh, he said, get married. But remember, if you get married, you you can't give all your time to ministry. He said, because, yeah, because the point I'm just made, it's not. It's not fair to your family to neglect them for the ministry. So you have to divide your time uh, because you're responsible. You're, you don't only have one responsibility. But Paul said, as for me, you know, he remains unmarried. And, and he said that because he didn't have this. Apparently, he didn't have this great need for a, a um, 
uh, sexual uh, desires that he was talking about. And uh, well, if you've got that kind of great sexual desire, the temptation is going to be great, and you'll probably end up fornicating. So at least do it within a marriage, but then you can't be a full time minister like me. Right. Uh, it'd be, it would be better if you could be like me, unmarried, no wife or children, mm-hmm. no responsibilities, nobody to answer to, or, or except the, 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 uh, the, the lost and the saved, you know, reaching out to the lost and, and ministering to, the, to the, the saints, and that his time was free for all that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this is the perspective that we have to, to uh, keep uh, in, in trying to do all these things. If you are married, uh, Brother Luke, then what what uh, duty comes first? And I know your answer, but what duty comes first, your your wife or your ministry? Well, your I think that your your priority has to always be. Um, well, first of all, I it reminds me of a shirt that someone bought me, uh, and it said J O Y Joy. And, and, and then it said, Jesus, mm-hmm. others, mm-hmm. yourself. Right. In other words, what has to come first is, is Jesus. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and, um, but Jesus does not want us to neglect our, our family. Absolutely. Okay? Uh, so I would say, uh, yeah, let's consider what Jesus would have, a, have us do. What, what would Jesus have me do? Not, would, well, not what would Jesus do? Right. We need to understand what, what did Jesus do is what we need to understand, and it's, yeah. and its application to us, and and uh, that's what's important. But then, as far as applying to us, it's not what would Jesus do; it's what would Jesus have us do, and and, and we want to try to live by that. And He says, "Okay, let's let's keep it, let the Holy Spirit direct us. Uh-huh. The Holy Spirit is going to direct us to take care of our wife and, and family." Yeah. Um, so uh, you're going to have joy if you think of yourself last. Mm-hmm. Think of Jesus first, and then how you can. It's like the same way that Jesus condensed the commandments. Yep. So love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now I don't know anybody that's done it. Right. Uh, uh, we've all failed. That yep. means, with all your heart, mind, and strength means means perfectly, and we can't. We don't have any perfect love, even for God. Isn't that right? Well, that, that we are incapable of doing that by ourselves. Yeah. Uh, okay. And so, uh, we and then he says, then love your neighbor and, and, as yourself. Um, yeah. But so, if if we should, um, God should be number one, then other people, and at the top of the list of the other people has to be your your the the ones in in your own family. Uh, there is a saying about that. It's not a scripture, but uh, something begins in your own family. Christianity begins in your family. I'm not. I think you get the point, but yeah. Uh, but uh, I know I'm not saying it right at all. And then, and then yourself last. Mm-hmm. Um, thinking of ourselves last, and so that's what Jesus uh, demonstrated to us uh, so many times by washing the feet of the apostles. He he uh, humiliated himself. As an example of, of uh, if, hey, if I'm willing to serve in this way, yeah. as an example to you, you should be willing to humble yourself and serve serve others, and think of yourself your your own needs last. Now, have I done that perfectly? No, uh, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm um, help me, help me to grow and, and uh, do better. I, mean, I don't think any of us are really putting God first others second and ourselves last all the time. We don't do that perfectly either, but I think it's a, it's a model for us to, to try to do. So if you look at the example you brought up, then Jesus first, others second, you last, uh, then obviously you, your, uh, the priority would be your relationship with Jesus. And then in, in that particular scenario, it would be your wife. Yeah. Now, when I got saved, I've heard you've heard me say this before in the interview of me and the testimony. Uh-huh. I first got saved. Um, I, I I had to move out of my own house mm-hmm. because my wife thought I lost my mind. Right. Uh, she expected me to not 
open the Bible in the house and and uh, and, and be like I was before, and not some Jesus freak. So I could have stayed at home and and just conformed to her what she wanted of me at that time, uh, but I couldn't. I had to. I said, okay, if if Jesus is not welcome here, I'll leave. Right. And, um, and of course, that lasted a few months, and and we reconciled, and you know, in two months we'll we'll have our fortieth wedding anniversary. Praise God. So my wife's attitude and, and her understanding of all this has, has grown in a lot over the years too. Right. But, uh, uh, that what in that case I was tested immediately. Uh huh. What am I going to do? Yeah. I have to choose between my wife and Jesus. Right. Um, all right. I think I that's that's uh, why it's so important to be uh, equally yoked with your uh, husband or wife. Yeah, you're on the same page. You're carrying the uh, the yoke of God, the yoke of Christ, equally, and uh, dispensing the uh, weight of it together, and headed in the yeah. same direction. Yes, um, this idea of being yoked is a beautiful picture. Um, yeah, uh, I think it's broader than just marriage. I think it applies to entering into a business partnership. Sure, it does. Yeah. Any kind of endeavors you want to do. Mm -hmm. But see, the problem with, it, with a marriage is sometimes people get married and they're unbelievers. Yep. Get married, as, mm -hmm. as uh, I was. Yeah. And you, when you become a believer, now you're unequally yoked. That's you correct. A different belief system than, than I did. So, uh, and I'm, now I'm unequally yoked. It wasn't my intention to be unequally yoked. But then what are you going to do? Uh, well, we have instructions. Paul instructs us. Jesus instructs us on, on all these things. Yeah. Uh, is, is there anybody in the chat room? Uh, uh, if you want to put your comment or your points in capital letters, uh, kind of, it's okay to shout it out to me. That way, I'll notice it. If you wanted me to respond, or Brother Cripps, if you want us to respond to anything there, put it in caps. Otherwise, uh, I won't notice it. I can't. I can't just read every single thing right now. It'll, it would distract us away from from uh, the, the study if I just did that. So let's get back to the verses. Unless you have more to say on anything, brother. No, sir. Go right ahead. Okay. So verse twenty six in the KJV says, "For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem." It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. Mm. All right, brother. You might be better at this KJV than me, but uh, do you want me to read it to the in the Amplified before you comment or not? That'd be great. I would love that, actually. Okay, let's look at those two verses in the Amplified. Okay. Uh, but for now, I'm going to Jerusalem to serve the saints, that is the, the Jewish believers there. Uh, for Gentile believers in uh, Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution to the poor among the saints, uh, the, the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. They were pleased to do it. Oh, good. Uh, that it? That's the two verses, okay? Verse 26 and 27. Uh, I think you read tw uh, uh, You read the next one because it's about the, okay. didn't you hear the spiritual things? Yeah. Okay, let me read 20, uh, 27 in the Amplified. Thank you. We're pleased to do it. Oh, yeah, I did read it. They mm. were pleased to do it, and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual things, then they are indebted to serve them also in intangible and material things. Okay, now mm -hmm. that sorted it out for me. Yeah, it did but, for me as well. It, it was like a little puzzle in KJV. I didn't really get it. The first time. <laughs> yeah, it's like those little finger traps. You stick stick one finger in one side and one in the other, and then you can't get them apart. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, so that that makes it pretty clear. So uh, he's uh, again, he's just explaining that uh, what his plans are moving forward, and he's saying that um, the, the the Jewish believers uh, bless the Gentiles, and the Gentiles, if they're blessing the Gentiles in spiritual things, wouldn't they also share in material things as well? And this goes back again to the way that it was uh, back in the day in the early church that they um, shared things. You know, if uh, if a brother or sister was uh, struggling in a certain area, then the church would um, help them, actually help them. And yes, there are churches uh, in different areas that do that still today. But um, and this again, this is a whole other subject. But I believe that we that people wouldn't need government assistance if the church was um, applying the same model uh, that the early church set up as to how we're supposed to help other people in the congregation if it comes up. Um, and I'm I'm just blessed to to be in an online uh, uh, church uh, situation where when I uh, struggled a few months back there there are people that uh, that helped me out uh, in my situation take care of my grandma and whatnot um, so that was really really uh, modeled uh, for me and I couldn't be more grateful and I I just uh, hope that everyone's in a uh, in a real church um, organization, uh, whether it be online or brick and mortar or just uh, people that you know in your community. Um, and, and I hope it's set up like that for you. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a portion of these verses here that um, make me um, talk, want to talk about, need to talk about um, my difference in eschatology. Okay. Than, than, uh, than most people in our congregation, right? Okay. We've changed for 25 years. Uh, um, I believed and taught, really defended the eschatological viewpoint of dispensational futurism, mm. and and I, I could, in the fewest words possible, it's 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 the belief that. Uh, there's going to be at some point a rapture of the believers and then uh, and, or but the rapture it may happen at, at the beginning or in the middle or at the end of a seven-year tribulation period right the dispute um pre mid or post tribulation rapture right but regardless of where you think the rapture is the dispensational viewpoint is that there will be a rapture and a tribulation period and the second coming mm -hmm. and then a, uh, a, a, a resurrection and yeah. judgment and, and then uh, eternity mm -hmm. that's the way time will play out um, along with a thousand year literal reign of christ on earth for a thousand right. years uh, well uh, that's the position i held and taught for a long time because of dr peter ruckman and uh, Clarence Larkin, and they're really, uh, they're, they were really uh, promoting the viewpoint presented by uh, John Nelson Darby. And, uh, oh, uh, but a few years back, uh, because people were asking me questions about my position and, I, and presenting other possibilities to me, I thought, well, I need to understand the other viewpoints. I don't understand them. So I decided I'd study other possible eschatological uh, viewpoints. And I was persuaded that that, uh, that that particular viewpoint was wrong. So now I see it a little differently. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that uh, this idea of uh, a uh, the, the place for the Jewish people and nation, uh, many people in our congregation uh, see it differently than I do. I see that there is no difference between Jew and Gentile now. And and I don't see any, any distinction. I don't think that uh, this idea of a 1,000 year literal millennial reign of Christ on earth dealing with Jewish people uh, is uh, something. I, I, I'm not going to go into the details of how I see it, but I just change my mind on it. Why am I bringing it up? Because here, uh, this He's saying that what the Jewish people did for the Gentile believers. So on one hand, 
I do not elevate the Jewish people today and, and say that they are uh, still going to inherit certain promises about a, a, a nation in the end times and all, all that. I don't, I don't hold to that. But does that mean that the uh, ministry important of the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people? No. This verse here I, makes me reflect back on chapter 9 and 10 that I made such a big deal about where Paul says, we got a problem here. Uh, people are saying, if Jesus is the promised one for the, uh, the Jewish people, scriptures write about, mm -hmm. then why is it that no Jews believe in him? Almost no Jews believe in him. Mm, good question. And, uh, and uh, he says, I mean, after all, shouldn't the Jews all believe in him? Because the Jews had the, uh, the scriptures, the talk that prophesied him. Uh, the Jews had the prophets. And the Jews also had the genealogy that he would be born from. And they had all that. They, they're the ones that should be automatic believers, not the Gentiles. Uh, so, uh, uh, in that way, he's saying the Jews have all that, and they, yet they're not believing, but we are in the Jews' debt, because through the Jews, we got the scriptures and the prophets, and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, and then David, this genealogy produced the Messiah. And, and so, uh, he wants us to understand and appreciate the, the importance of the nation of Israel, and all these individuals that God has used. Um, and right here, I think he's making the point again, uh, probably six chapters later, he's alluding to it. He's not going into all the detail that right. he did in 9, but here he's saying, uh, for the Gentiles, for the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual things, these spiritual things, these were, the Jewish people thought, it's only for them anyway. They, they remember, they didn't even, number one, they didn't dream that Gentiles would be part of this. Right. These prophecies. That They're they, dogs. Directly to them at all. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, they would not even break bread with the Gentile. They would never let a Gentile even walk through their front door. Yeah. A Jew would never walk through a Gentile's front, front door. That's why when Peter went into Cornelius' house, James and the Jerusalem church are shocked. You, you're, you, you're unclean. You associate with uncleanness. And uh, so that was their, their attitude. And, uh, 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 but here it's saying, uh, look, we're in uh, their debt. The Gentiles are in their debt because from them, this, these spiritual things that we understand and believe and are blessed by now, mm -hmm. the spiritual gift of eternal life. Right. Uh, we need to appreciate the fact that it's the Jews that, that well, this was accomplished through. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so he's saying, in a way, you owe the Jews. It's, it's you know, not just charity. <laughs> you owe them. So, so get, you know, let's don't raise some money here because you do owe the Jews. Uh, so he is um, making them uh, aware uh, that hey, there isn't a, a debt in a way. I don't. I, how do you see that, brother? Uh, I see it the same way. I mean, I can't help but see it that way. There is a debt, um, and in fact, uh, it's made very clear in Scripture. You know, we're grafted in, and also the prophecy that talks about that all the nations will be blessed by them. Um, I, I take the Bible uh, for its word. Uh, um, now, it becomes a slippery slope with Zionism and people lifting up the, um, the state of Israel, the, the godless uh, state of Israel. And they don't understand that these uh, verses are talking about the spiritual Israel first. And, and yes, the region or the, uh, the, the location, the physical country will, will also eventually bless all the nations as well, but they're talking about spiritual Israel. So that can get pretty slippery. Um, you know, we're, we do owe them a, a debt, but most of all, it comes down to what we owe Christ. Uh, and then uh, what we owe uh, the Father, Father God as well for allowing us to be partakers in the thing that was originally meant for only the Jewish people. 
Uh, but that was his plan the whole time. Um, he didn't decide later on. He says, "Oh, I'm going to add. I'm going to add the Gentiles as well." Uh, but to the Jewish people, it did seem uh, that way because, as you said uh, correctly, in my opinion, um, they had no idea that they were going to be included, and they treated them horribly. Uh, and and even after uh, 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 Paul is uh, bringing the Gentiles in and and kind of saying to 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 Peter, even the argument that he had with Peter, he was like trying to trying to make it clear. I mean, God had to send Peter a dream. You know, the, the blanket being uh, the sheet or the blanket or whatever that was um, lowered down from heaven with all the unclean animals, et cetera, that was um, had a double impact. But, uh, yeah, a lot of people struggled with that, the, the idea of the Gentiles being allowed in. And, and you also said it on this broadcast and talked about we're going to impose this, uh, talking about James and Paul. Let's, well, let's all, only impose these few things on them. Um, so yeah, it's it, it's it's slippery when it comes to Zionism. You have to be real careful of that. But. Yeah, and uh, well, some people uh, have never really thought this out. I mean, most of us who really spend a lot of time studying the Bible uh, would would understand this. What I'm going to say now, but uh, your average person, uh, even Christian, even doesn't understand that uh, Adam and Eve were not Jewish people. I mean, you know, we think of Adam and Eve as, as uh, being, uh, you know, that's Old Testament. The Old Testament is a Jewish book. Yeah. It's Adam and Eve. Right. And, uh, but the promise, this promise was made to non-Jews, to Adam and Eve. Yeah, there weren't any. Yeah. I was just backing your point up. There weren't any Jews. Abraham was considered the father of of the Israeli people. There wasn't any, weren't any Jews before that before that time and abraham himself wasn't one <laughs> he yeah. wasn't one either yeah uh, you're right abraham was not a jew right. technically uh even um jacob who was not a jew technically he was an israelite because right. his name was changed to israel right so he and his descendants are israelites right but he was not a Jew because the Jew is is even just even more narrow technically. We we we, we paint him with a broad brush uh, or the broad genealogy. People use the word Jew, but it's really just the uh, the tribe of Judah, the uh, of the twelve sons of uh, Jacob. Um, Judah uh, is the one that the, the Jew. The word Jew is based upon his name, Judah. So his particular family, and you know, you had ten tribes up north, and the two, Benjamin and Judah, and in the, in the south, and there was this division. I can't, I can't go into detail on all that because I don't know it well enough, really. But um, that's when you think of Jew, uh, Jews. That's that particular part of of the family. Right. Absolutely. Um, okay. So, but the point is, yeah, this this promise. Uh, uh, this idea of um, um, even though everything I just said about um, the prophets, the scriptures, uh, the genealogy, and then Messiah coming through this nation of Israel and this this family line, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, Jesse, David, these are the, all the people that are prophesied in the scripture where it says that this person will, will uh, they are in line. That, that's their part of the line uh, for the, uh, the birth of the Messiah. Uh, so all those people, um, they weren't. There were no Jews until until that you know that one that was born Judah. All right, I'm, I'm probably over overdoing that. So let's go on. Well, it's only the two of us, so we have to stretch it out a little bit. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. We don't have Renee, you know, t taking up uh, her portion of time, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it's too bad Renee's not here. I'm sure she'd have some um, uh, different take on some of the things I've said. Okay, uh, let's go uh, verse uh, 29. Uh, and I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Okay, so that sentence kind of stands alone, brother. What, what do you say about that? 
I'm going to look at it in the Amplified as well, just to be sure. Is I'll, that read, I'll read it in the Amplified. It says, I, I know that when I do come to you, I will come in the abundant blessing of Christ. So they don't say gospel in the Amplified. Okay. Either way, um, he's just he's just stating uh, the the true source of all things for him, and he says that in other verses as well that everything comes from everything comes from Christ. Everything comes uh, from uh, spiritual uh, gifts given to him by Christ. Um, he even states that uh, he he's the least of all apostles, and the whole reason why he's an apostle in the first place, or even considered an apostle. Um, and and he was uh, talking about the, the the reason being is because he uh, attacked the church, and um, it is it is literally by a, a, a road to Damascus experience by which um, he he's giving all credit to the the literally the person uh, of the Godhead that brought him into the whole thing in the first place. Yes. Abundant blessing. I like that word though. Abundant blessing. And it also makes me think of what we have in him, which is an abundant life through Christ. Now, I, I might be making too much uh, of this difference, but I want to talk about it. And in the KJV, uh, you know, the KJV has a lot of extra verses and words that are not in the modern translations. Mm -hmm. I want the extra. I mean, uh, let's just say that I believe the word, all the verses in the KJV are supposed to be there. Right, then that they're uh, removed from many of the modern translations, or there's a footnote saying, uh, "Hey, well, we suspect that this was not in the original. It was, it was added by a scribe." So right. that, that kind of uh, question, question that verse. Um, but uh, this KJV does say uh, in verse 29, he says, "I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ." In the Amplified, it says, I do come to you, I will come in the abundant blessing of Christ. Now, I have to think that they're both saying the same thing. Yeah. Because Jesus is the gospel. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. That's right. Look, hey, how do I do that? Here, here. Yeah. I, 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 I'm holding my hand up at the screen, Brother Luke. I thought. <laughs> And this is a distinction that I've made that, that has caused uh, a lot of people to want to argue with me about, about things. And that uh, I say that um, in, in my statement of faith, if you read the, the content of the statement of faith, it's in the description box of every one of my videos. It starts off that Jesus is the object of my faith. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's this person. It, it's, I mean, obviously, I'm going to make sure that a person knows exactly who he is, exactly what he's accomplished, what he promised, and what it means to us as believers. I want to make sure they understand all that. I want to be as completely as I can and as thorough as I can yes. in teaching the, the gospel. Yes. But it really boils down to that um, if Jesus is your Savior, you're saved by a person. It's the same as this. Um, look at, look at this. You see that? Yeah. That, that, it, oh, let me put, uh, freeze it on my picture. When you talk, your, your think screen comes up. So I said it just to only be on this picture here for a minute. Sure. Look at that. I mean, I, I don't know of a better picture of, of salvation. This is a person. This is not a, a series of Bible verses. This is not a series of doctrines. This is this is a person saving another person, mm -hmm. and um, if we don't understand that when we say Jesus is my Savior, that means that you are relying, depending on this person to save you from condemnation and bring you to life everlasting. You're depending on that person to do it. Yeah. So this person, Jesus, who happens to be God, yeah. Manifest in the flesh as the Son of God, fully God, fully man, had yep. to be man so that he could die, had to be God because only God could be a savior. Right. So, uh, if, uh, but it's this person that our faith is in. And uh, 
So I think when it says abundant blessing of Christ and abundant blessing of the gospel of Christ, the gospel of Christ is this person gives eternal life. This person, Jesus, is the sole source of life, everlasting. Mm -hmm. Amen. And so... Uh, Amen. And he's the first fruit. So when we think of him, he's not a spirit any longer. Uh, he actually has the first fruits of what we're going to experience, the Okotirion, uh, the eternal body that will be given. So that picture that you're using, it, it might appear uh, pretty close to that. You know, when we see him, he, we know that he's uh, has the, the nail scars in his hand uh, still to this day. Um, if you if you're looking at the screen, there is a question that someone uh, put in caps uh, that uh, we should probably answer. You've talked about this before, but Little Ingstrom says, "Is the Amplified Bible a good translation to read other than the KJV?" And um, so you might uh, feel like it was worth taking a second to explain why someone would use the Amplified. Okay, yeah, it, it is important to answer that question. Uh, um, well, Little Engstrom, um, my own experience was uh, um, I read the KJV uh, initially and got saved. And then shortly after that, I started reading other translations and, and because uh, the modern English is easier to understand. And then I, I found out about this guy named Dr. Peter Ruckman, and he was the, uh, he's the champion. He's, he's, he's recently... Uh, left to be with the Lord. He was 90 something, but he was the most respected authority person promoting the King James only position. Right. That we should only read in the King James version, avoid all other translations. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, uh, so that's when I, when I started learning from him, I read about 40 of his books. And so I, I relied on him. He was my main teacher. Right. Uh, whatever he said, I just accepted. I didn't know any better. And and he was wonderful in a lot of ways. I learned a lot from him. But I, I, I've since parted with a couple, some of his uh, positions. And one of them is KJV only. Mm -hmm. and that is that my position now is that uh, uh, I read the KJV first. Um, and, and so there was a guy that called me, hey, you're a KJV firstist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I embraced the term. I'm a KJV yeah. firstist. I'm always going to read it first, and uh, it's it's beautiful. It's poetic. It's it's more complete. It has more mm -hmm. verses, as I said, than the other translations. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the modern translations challenge some of the verses in the KJV. They challenge whether they should be in the Bible or not. So I want to have a Bible that has all the verses, and it's, it's beautifully written. However, it's not even my native tongue. It's all, it's borderline a foreign language <laughs> because of the way English is spoken at that time is different than we speak it today. So um, uh, I probably understand about 90% of the verses without any issues. And I'm pretty educated. I, I finished college and I've studied a lot over the years. And so I, I'm not, it's not like I don't understand the, the English language very well, but uh, the modern translations are easier to understand but they may be seriously wrong. Many times they take the idea of repentance and uh, they tend to say repentance of sin. That's the way they interpret it. And, and uh, that's one of the biggest errors uh, that, that is being taught, uh, thinking that uh, the Bible says that we repent and believe. Uh, I say that, that means that we change our mind and believe. I didn't right. really believe that Jesus was my savior and he's the one that gave me eternal life and it's guaranteed to me by Jesus. I didn't used to believe that. I changed my mind and now I believe that. So that's what I believe. But the modern translations, oftentimes they'll take the word repent and say, uh, repent of your sins, or maybe they'll even elaborate further and say, uh, get sin out of your life and reform your life. And, yep. and and do good works and stuff. So yeah. uh, that's what you have to guard against in, in all the modern translations. Yeah. I'll be getting back to this Amplified. I like the Amplified because what is it? The, the name Amplified should tell you something. It should. 
Uh, it means that you are expounding your thoughts on the verse. Mm -hmm. That's what Brother Cripps is doing tonight. I say, well, expound on that. Amplify it for me, brother. And that's what I do. And Renee and all of us are doing these teachings. We amplify or expound or comment on these verses. And so the Amplified is like having another person with us or probably a committee of people that did the yeah. Amplified version. So it's, it's like having them here with us and giving their thoughts on these verses. They rephrase it in a way that sometimes it's easier to understand. And, and many times it's very helpful to me and others. However, occasionally in the Amplified, just like in the other modern translations, we find a verse and say, uh oh, you can now can you see why we need to rely on the KJV as our scripture? Because these modern translations sometimes they uh, they uh, they translate it or amplify it in a way that is is uh, seriously wrong. Amen. So we we test we read the KJV and then the Amplified. Sometimes it helps us, but we're testing the Amplified against the KJV as we as we read it. Amen. Okay. You want to say anything about that before we go on? I well, no, I agree with everything you said, and you've said that before on the show. But uh, the, the the of little Ingstrom is uh, just clarifying that and wanting that to be clarified. I think you did a good job. Um, so whatever other version of a Bible that you use, um, I I like Brother Luke am a KJV KJV firstist as well, and I like that term. Uh, but I do love the Amplified, and on these broadcasts, uh, we've come across a few uh, instances where uh, we might have completely disagreed with the way the Amplified has said something, but generally speaking, it amplifies, it does exactly what the name implies, it amplifies what's being read out of the K KJV yeah. version. Yeah, uh, Bible Literalist says, I like Greek. Uh, uh, brother, brother Michael, uh, Ultimate Mordecai, he, he uses Greek a lot in yeah. uh, all the time in all of his study and teaching, and uh, that's a good idea. That's why I like I I like I use Greek too, but not my not my own Greek. I just ask watch Brother Ultimate Mordecai, and he'll tell me what it says in Greek and explain it to me. So I use I'll use him for that purpose. Yeah. So yeah, all these things can be helpful, but I think it's dangerous and unfair to yourself to limit yourself and say, I, I will not even look at other translations. Right. I, I don't think that's a reasonable position to take. Anymore. Yeah, I would agree. Now, let me just ask you this before we move forward. Now, did you uh, say that bit about repentance because you saw it going on in the chat? Are you aware that there's no. there's uh, an ongoing discussion? Uh, Z will is, is uh, making the assertion that, uh, that repentance uh, doesn't mean change of mind. Uh, he's explaining that it, it means um, turning away. Um, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, obviously, but you can scroll up and look at what yeah. he's saying. Okay, um, well, um, the, um, if, if repentance in the Bible um, for salvation means that you have to stop sinning, get sin out of your life, then there's not a single person saved, including Z or me or anybody else. Right. None of us have been successful at getting all the sin out of our lives. Right. The law requires that you do it 100% perfectly. Mm -hmm. So Z, uh, who is it? Z something? Z Will. Z Will is his name. Z Will. Um, if you want to um, translate repent as getting the sin out of your life, uh, uh, that's what's required to be a Christian, then um, you're not saved either because you, you had, did you get all the sin out of your life completely? Have you? And you think that w works are necessary for us to get, to get saved? Well, then tell me all the works you do. I'd like to see your resume. Yeah, he's, he's clear. Every, he's every clear. day when you wake up, uh, you know, for you from the beginning to the end of the day, Tell me every day all the good religious works you're doing to earn your salvation. Um, when I ask people that, they uh, their their resume is greatly lacking. They're doing right. no works at all, and yet telling us we got to do works and we got to get sin out of our life. But Z will will and anybody else make make that argument. Um, you're you're obviously sinning as you as you take that position because that's the sin of spiritual pride. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, now, but we don't. We really want our chat room uh, to um, be used for this arguing because, see, this is this is actually an affront to the core doctrines of Christianity. Yeah. The core doctrines that we embrace in this church and this congregation are that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. Now, if someone in the chat room wants to argue that Jesus is not God Almighty, that he's merely a great man or a prophet, then uh, you don't say that in the chat room where you'll be excluded. You're welcome to listen, but we don't want you arguing against the core doctrine. And Z will, if you want to argue that repentance of sin is necessary for salvation, uh, then stop doing it. Otherwise, I'm going to have to exclude you, or I hope that uh, one of the moderators will exclude you. You're welcome to listen, but the chat room is not for people to come in to this church and argue that our core doctrine is is uh, wrong. Also, the third core doctrine is that we have eternal security. Eternal security actually is the gospel. If someone does not believe that their eternal life has been guaranteed to them by Jesus and it's settled, it's irrevocable, irreversible, then, then they don't understand the gospel. So right. we don't let, I don't want people coming into this church. And when you're in the chat room, you've entered our church. And, and to come into a church and then start arguing that your core doctrines are wrong, well, you won't be welcome if that's what you're doing. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, the next verse, uh, 29. 29. No, this is 30. 30. 30 yeah. Uh, going back to the KJV. It says, uh, now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Yeah. That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service, which I have, uh, that I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints, mm -hmm. that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Um, okay, there's a lot of interesting points in there, brother. Sure. Yeah. So you're saying, come on. Come on, guys, <laughs> uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that you strive together. Let's all work together in prayer for him. He's saying he's asking for prayer for himself, um, that he, he may uh, be delivered, that he may have help, and that the people there would believe in what he's going to teach, that the service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. Uh, and then lastly, verse 32, uh, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed. Um, this is wonderful. Uh, a man that I would hold uh, highly on the scale of, uh, of a saint asking for other uh, saints to pray for him. Um, we all need that. And I mentioned that earlier about uh, lifting other people up and edifying other people. And prayer is certainly uh, the, the the best way to do that uh and and paul's uh, uh in my opinion being humble is telling him, look um uh pray pray for me for christ's sake um that the message would be received by the people that he he wants to reach in jerusalem yeah um uh, i think it was hendrix or maybe it was bob uh, they made a point earlier about how Paul had desired for a long time to go to Rome. And we know that, you know, eventually he does go to Rome. And, and he's, uh, there's a prophet that, that prophesies that if he does go to Rome, he will never return. And he, right. That will be the end of him. And uh, uh, Paul decides to go anyway. Yeah. Probably, I, I think he believed the prophecy. He just knew that he had to do it. And it was going to cost him his life. Yeah. So, yeah, he did have a great desire to go to Rome, and he did uh, eventually go. But he also, with this Jerusalem question here, it says, uh, verse 31, you know, verse 30 says, um, strive together with me in your prayers to God for me that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea 
and that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints. Mm. You know, I've uh, made a lot of videos. I continue bringing this kind of a point up over and over again because this is a point that there, there's a couple of points, uh, theological positions I hold that are unfortunately almost unique here in among all of us on YouTube that everybody, that, all of our friends and everybody that we're hanging out together and fellowshipping together. And, and one of them is Paul Oleism. I don't know anybody besides me that's making videos and, and constantly teaching against Paul only or hyper dispensationalism, Bollingerism, less Celtic, the contemporary teacher of this country and others. Uh, but I, uh, I, I'm on a mission to refute that and correct it. I, I'm, I'm offended because I think it's an offense to Jesus. They're elevating Paul above Jesus. Agreed. Um, and then there's another position I hold in that um, my position on uh, this this timeline of uh, events in the book of Acts. Uh, only when I really understood the timeline did did the puzzle fit together. I finally finally saw it. Uh, if you read the book of Acts, I remember I, I, I thought as I'm reading the book of Acts, you had Pentecost. And about two or three weeks later, we had the stoning of Stephen. And then you had another event, another event. And this was, this was, uh, you know, these events were happening, bing, 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 like that. But these major events in the book of Acts, it's documenting about a 30 year period of the first 30 years of church history. Mm -hmm. And when we understand that uh, uh, Pentecost, I believe, is the beginning of the church. Paul onlyism says no. It began with Paul's conversion, or even some say Paul's uh, prison epistles. That's how yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The the church started in Acts. Uh, what is it? Acts ten or somewhere in Acts. That's when the the the, the uh, bride of Christ actually started, and before that, there it, it didn't yeah. exist. That's, uh, so I believe. It